and welcome to the Dynamic Duel Podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Marvelous Joe. And I'm his twin brother, Johnny DC. And in this episode, we are going to find out who would win in a fight between the Green Lantern character, Kilowog, against the Thor-related character, Beta Ray Bill. Now, these are both alien creatures who are counterparts to Earth heroes, Green Lantern and Thor, but they're just ugly as hell. They're fugly, <laughs> as it were. and uh, Which means fun and ugly. <laughs> they haven't had a huge presence in the films. Uh, I know Kilowog appeared in the Green Lantern movie for a bit, and Beta Ray Bill had a brief Easter egg cameo in Thor Ragnarok because he was depicted as a previous uh, gladiatorial warrior on Sakaar. And Thor's whole, like, Stormbreaker axe hammer thing. Yeah, that was an integral weapon in Avengers Endgame and Infinity War that actually belongs to Beta Ray Bill. So, I don't know how many people will actually listen to this, but I know that the diehard fans will, and this episode is for you guys. That's right. Before we get into that duel, though, we're going to break down the comic book movie news from this past week. There was a lot of news, a lot of DC news. We got the first official The Suicide Squad Red Band trailer. We learned that Black Widow got a new release date and that it'll be simultaneously released in theaters and on Disney+. Plus. We learned that Pierce Brosnan has been cast as Dr. Fate in the upcoming Black Adam movie. Yep. And that got a release date. And we learned that Helen Mirren has been cast as the villain in the Shazam sequel. As always, we list our segment times in our episode description, so feel free to check out the show notes if you want to skip ahead to a particular topic. If you guys want to support this podcast, there are a number of ways you can do that, and everything helps. Uh, The first way is you can follow this show on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, and then share it with your Marvel and DC loving friends and family. Yeah, particularly Instagram. We're shooting for a thousand followers. Yeah, once we reach that, we have a special surprise for you guys. You can also support the show by rating us or reviewing us on your platform of choice, including Apple Podcasts or Podchaser.com. And finally, you could also join us on Patreon, where you can chat with Johnny and I on Discord, or you can listen to blooper reels of this show that we put out every month, as well as more awesome perks, including the ability to become an executive producer of this show. Thanks to everyone who shows us they care by supporting this podcast. We enjoy making it just for you listeners. And with that out of the way, quick to the no prize. So a no prize is an award that Marvel used to give out up until the 90s to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Duel No Prize, is a digital award that we post on social media that I personally draw for those who we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. Last week's question was in regards to the release date change for Venom Let There Be Carnage. We asked you guys, when is the earliest you can see yourself going back to theaters to watch films? And we did not get a whole lot of answers for this particular question, possibly because you guys were still ruminating on it, but mostly because Jonathan sucks and what? didn't post the question to our social media accounts. Okay, blame me. I, I'll just pass that blame on to all of our listeners who <laughs> wanted to answer but didn't. Thanks for making me look bad, guys. <laughs> We got three answers total. Two of you guys said that you're already ready to go to the theater because you've already been back. I'm in the same boat. I went back to go see New Mutants and everything. Granted, you know, I I made sure to be very careful during this pandemic. But we did get one unique answer that I really liked. So first, big thanks to Corey Wooten and Mickey Madden-Gihan for your answers. The winner of this week's No Prize is CJ Craft, who said... Hey guys, CJ Craft here. I don't know if I will go back to movie theaters in general, just because ever since the pandemic hit, my love for drive-in theaters has really increased, and I find myself enjoying drive-ins more and more and think more people should go out and enjoy them because they're such an important part of American history. But that said, I think the new Halloween movie in the fall will probably bring me to theaters. But other than that, drive-ins all the way. And I love this answer because I also love drive-in theaters yeah they're totally underrated yeah i think the last time i went to the drive-in theater was this past halloween when i went to a drive-in haunted house and that was really cool what is that it was basically just a series of short scary films that they showed up on the screen and they had a bunch of actors in costume kind of like pounce at your car and try to scare you while you're in your car it was pretty cool no fuck that (laughs) i would not like that (laughs) it was awesome some of my best movie going experiences have been at the drive-in and they are a great compromise during the pandemic time I know a lot of people are getting vaccinated right now, but, you know, there's still a lot of variants and still rising cases. So going to the drive-in is something that I definitely will be doing this summer. Oh, yeah, I can't wait. The drive-ins have always been there for me, especially when I had, like, newborn children and I couldn't take them to the movie theater. We could always go to the drive-in. 
Plus, you get like three films for the price of one at my local drive-in at least. Yeah. So it's a really good time. Yeah. The downside is, you know, a lot of people may not have drive-in theaters that are next to them. So if you're comfortable going back to the theater, just be as careful as you can. But yeah, congrats again to CJ Craft. Uh, you win this week's no prize. If you, the listener, want a shot at winning your own no prize, stay tuned to later on this episode when we'll be asking another question of the week. And now that that's done, on to the news. <laughs> Okay, we got our first look at the Suicide Squad film directed by James Gunn last year during DC's Fandom event, but they never released a trailer for it. This past week, we got our first official trailer for the film, and it's a Red Band trailer, which is awesome, because if you're going to do a Suicide Squad movie, it better be rated R. Yeah, not like the first one. No, no, that one should have been, but it wasn't. The trailer ended up being not quite what I expected. I think that my biggest takeaway from it was that there was a lot more set pieces than I thought there were going to be. Because from the promotional material that we saw last year, a lot of the shots were in this jungle set. Yeah. And here, they look like they're going all over the place. Yeah, we see some of those jungle shots in this trailer, but we also see like a small city. We also get to see Argus headquarters. The film really does seem like it's like a globetrotting type adventure for these not quite heroes. Yeah, not necessarily like one mission focused like the last movie was. But maybe like a series of missions. Yeah. One of them being to rescue Harley, which is what the trailer starts off with. And it's a great gag, great setup for her just walking out and being like, hey guys, like we, we were going to save you. It was a really good plan. It's funny how like touched she is by that. Yeah. <laughs> this is the best I think we've ever seen Harley Quinn in live action by Margot Robbie. I love the red and black. Yeah, the red and black really sells it in such a simple way, you know? She looks like iconic Harley Quinn. I'm so sick of the pink and blue. She should always stick with the red and black. I agree. I think it just lends itself more to like a playing card kind of jester kind of character. After that, we kind of get like a setup of what the Suicide Squad is. You know, we get to visit all these different characters in prison as they're injected with bombs in the back of their neck. We get to see Savant. We get to see Weasel. And that guy's creepy, (laughs) but it's also hilarious. One of the standout characters of this trailer for me is absolutely King Shark, though. This guy is what makes this Red Band trailer Red Band. He's biting people's heads off. He's ripping them in half. And I guess he's voiced by Sylvester Stallone. I like the part where he raised his hand and Amanda Waller was like, yes, that's your hand. (laughs) He just looks so (laughs) proud of himself. (laughs) For me, the standout wasn't King Shark. I really liked John Cena's Peacemaker. He looks like he's going to be hilarious. All these characters look like they're going to be hilarious because James Gunn is just a funny writer. Yeah, like the whole dicks joke towards the end of the trailer, when he's like, if somebody told me to eat a beach full of dicks for liberty, I would gladly do it. (laughs) Like everyone was talking for a while about maybe James Gunn taking on another comic book property like Superman or something like that. The Suicide Squad, hands down, was like made for James Gunn. Yeah, I mean, it's a team of bad guys. They're going to be crass. James Gunn is crass. It works. I think my favorite scene, though, is when Rick Flagg and Bloodsport are threatening the thinker, and then Harley Quinn jumps in, and she's like, if you have a personalized license plate, you die. If you cough without covering your mouth, you die. And I just love Rick Flagg's response. Like, don't think that's an open invitation to cough without covering your mouth, though. The biggest surprise to be revealed in the trailer, though, was actually Starro. We had heard that he was going to be in the film, but I figured that they would have saved him for later marketing material, not for the first trailer. And he looks awesome. It just added this crazy element to the movie where you think it's going to be fun and bombastic and foul-mouthed and action-packed and everything like that. But then they're like, it's a freaking kaiju. It's like, this movie is so bonkers. It's almost ridiculous. It's over the top. They're throwing everything in the kitchen sink inside this movie. Is the main mission of the film to defeat Starro? Or is he just kind of like a wild card element introduced in the third act or something? The way this film looks structured, I wouldn't be surprised either way. Yeah, I thought the main villain was supposed to be like a South American dictator or something. But how Starro ties into that? No idea. I love it, though. The movie looks like it's going to be action-packed, hilarious, with Harley Quinn saying, Oh, don't you love the rain? It's like angels are splooging all over us. It's like, ugh! (laughs) The film comes out August 6th, and this trailer has me totally pumped for it. I'm not sure how many more trailers they're going to drop for this, considering the release is like less than six months away. This movie is going to do heavy business for HBO Max. I hope so. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's not exactly a four quadrant film. I think the demographic is pretty niche, but I still think that niche will show up for this in droves. I will. I totally will. Yep. In a bit of Marvel news, we learned this past week that the Black Widow film will no longer be released on May 7th. It will now come out on July 9th, which is bad. But what's good is that the movie is going to theaters and Disney Plus on the same day. Kind of like what HBO Max is doing. Except, of course, with Disney Plus, you have to pay 30 bucks to see the movie. 
So it's like copying DC, but worse. That's Marvel in a nutshell. Not really, because Disney Plus is so much cheaper than HBO Max. So you're still paying more for HBO Max regardless. You get what you pay for. I mean, considering I'm almost positive that Black Widow is going to be better than Wonder Woman 1984, I don't know about that. Ugh. We'll see. Check your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> One unfortunate side effect of this movie moving is that it took Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings spot, which means that Shang-Chi is now going to come out on September 3rd. Luckily, it didn't push every other Marvel release date back, so we're also still going to get the Eternals film, as well as Spider-Man No Way Home this year. I'm confused as to why Black Widow had to be pushed back at all. That is a very valid question. Like, if they're just going to release it on Disney Plus the same day, why the push? Why did that have to happen? And I think the answer has everything to do with the theatrical box office. They want to wait until more people are vaccinated and more people are more comfortable going back to theaters. And the later you push that out, the better for the theatrical box office. It doesn't seem like they're confident that they can recoup any losses through the Disney Plus platform. And I'm sure releasing in, you know, summertime in the Northern Hemisphere doesn't hurt either. Right. I may actually go see this in theaters. At the very least, I will be going to the drive-in to see it. Mainly because I don't want to pay $30 for this movie when I'm going to be paying for it digitally later to own it. Yeah, this whole premiere access thing, I hate it. I mean, it makes sense. Just compare it to buying a movie ticket, except you get to watch the movie at home. I'll probably still do premiere access because in the long run, it's going to be cheaper for me. You can't do Premiere Access because you mooch off of my Disney Plus account. In the end, I think I'm going to make you pay for Premiere Access, so <laughs> it's going to be cheaper for me. I'm not going to pay for Premiere Access. <laughs> I'm going to go to the drive-in, meaning you have to go to the drive-in, too. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm just going to buy it on your account anyway. I have access to you it. You better fucking not do that. <laughs> that would be so shitty. I mean, I'd still watch it, but again, I don't want to pay for it twice to watch it on my TV. If I'm going to pay for it twice, it's going to be for the big screen experience, then the small screen experience. I mean, if you pay for it on Disney Plus, too, it kind of shows them that you're looking forward to future upcoming Marvel releases to also be on Disney Plus. I'd be surprised if this Premiere Access thing lasted until September 3rd when uh, Shang-Chi comes out. So really, I don't care if the Premiere Access experiment is a success or not, because I don't think it'll last forever regardless. We'll see. I mean, HBO will still be doing it throughout the rest of this year. Yeah. But they did recently announce a deal with Cinemark and Regal Cinemas that in 2022, they're going to stop doing that. So yeah, maybe it is temporary. Speaking of 2022 films, the Black Adam film finally has a release date of July 29th next year, which is awesome. We've been waiting for a release date for that film ever since Warner Brothers shifted the DC film schedules. So it's nice to know that the film will be coming pretty soon with Pierce Brosnan as Kent Nelson, a.k.a. Dr. Fate, which is the most badass casting ever. That was amazing news. Uh, Pierce Brosnan is a great get for this movie. I know that I was kind of hoping for an actor of Middle Eastern descent, considering that Dr. Fate is a superhero with strong ties to ancient Egypt. I guess in this context, it'll be ancient Kandak. But um, the casting seems pretty spot on with the comics. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I would say Pierce Brosnan sort of looks a little bit more like the Hector Hall version of Dr. Fate. But regardless, it's great to get an actor of his caliber in the role. I have to say, I'm jealous as hell. Heck yeah, you are. Like, this is the second James Bond actor to join the DC universe, including Timothy Dalton, who's the chief on Doom Patrol, and now this. And me being a huge James Bond fan, I'm just wondering when we can get, like, Daniel Craig on our team. Never. He's going to join DC. No one wants to do Marvel anymore. What are you talking about? It's played out, man. It might as well just have ended with Endgame. DC is on the rise. Marvel's on the downslope. You shut your mouth. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> how dare you it's reality you don't know that you're just saying shit i mean we went an entire year without an mcu film i think it all depends on black widow honestly as to whether or not the general public will still even care about marvel i think you're reaching i think you're just trying to say hurtful things that you want <laughs> to be true but have no basis in reality we'll see <laughs> Back to Black Adam, this was actually kind of a surprising bit of news regarding Pierce Brosnan's casting, considering they sort of went against type with the other cast members, including Aldous Hodges' Hawkman and Condessa Swindell as Cyclone. I didn't think they were going to be as on the nose as they were. Honestly, I thought they were going to go with someone much more diverse for Dr. Fate. But I don't mind this casting at all. W would I have preferred someone like Dr. Fate to be Khalid Nassour, that version of the character? Yeah, but you could always do that down the road. Dr. Fate is absolutely a legacy character where the helm could be passed on from person to person. That would actually be a great plot point for a Dr. Fate solo movie. 
Yeah, absolutely. Considering that Pierce Brosnan, you know, he's kind of getting up there in age now. He can't necessarily start a franchise, but he can certainly pass on a franchise. Yeah, and I guess the studio has that in mind. Now, in Black Adam-related news, the Shazam sequel, Fury of the Gods, recently cast its lead villain in Helen Mirren, who will be playing Hespera in the sequel. Now, Hespera is an original character for the film. She's not from the comics. But in mythology, she's one of the three daughters of Atlas. Why can't the villain be Black Adam? That's a great question. Why can't the villain be Mr. Mind? I thought that's what they were setting up. I'm not sure why they're doing an original character for the villain, honestly. And I'm not sure why they're also going into Greek gods territory, considering that's sort of Wonder Woman's thing, you know? Well, judging off of Wonder Woman 1984, they do seem to be ignoring that aspect of the character. Which kind of sucks, because I really liked that about the Snyder Cut. Getting to see Zeus and Artemis and Ares, that was really cool. I love that aspect of the character. The whole mythological angle for Shazam is definitely there, but it's less pronounced. I'd rather see him deal with Egyptian deities, if anything, considering the wizard Shazam's roots go back to ancient Egypt. That said, I have total faith in David F. Sandberg to deliver the goods. I loved the first Shazam film. I think it captures the spirit and tone of the comics, probably more so than a lot of the DC films to date. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what plays out here. So overall, you're okay with this original character then? As long as Mr. Mind ties into it in some way, because I loved that cameo in the first film, and I don't want them to drop that. But on the topic of original characters, that brings us to our question of the week. Who is your favorite original character to appear in a Marvel or DC film that did not previously appear in the comics? There's only so many of these out there, and we'd love to hear your takes on this. Record your answer at dynamicduel.com by clicking on the red microphone button in the bottom right-hand corner, which will prompt you to leave us a voicemail. Your message can be up to 30 seconds long, and don't forget to leave your name in case we include you on the podcast. We'll pick our favorite answer and draw that person a Dynamic Duel no prize that we'll post to social media. Be sure to answer before April 3rd. But I think that does it for all the news for this episode, so let's go ahead and get into our main event, where we find out who would win between the Green Lantern character Kilowog and the Thor-related character Beta Ray Bill. Let's do it! All right, Kilowog versus Beta Ray Bill in a dual matchup with a face that only a mother could love. These two guys are horrifying to look at. They should both be wearing masks, and neither of them do. <laughs> Kilowog looks like this weird warthog. It's like a pig and a bulldog mixed. Yeah, yeah. And Beta Ray Bill looks like a horse with no lips wearing Thor's helmet. Right, it's like something from your nightmares. Exactly, both of these guys. But uh, despite how horrific they look, they're characters with hearts of gold. Yeah, I wouldn't quite describe them as horrifying, more like metal as hell. (laughs) Yeah, actually, that's a great way of looking at it. Metal as hell. Kilowog is a prime member of the Green Lantern Corps from DC Comics. He's the one who trained Hal Jordan in how to use his ring when he first became a Green Lantern. And Beta Ray Bill is one of the most noble creatures in the entire Marvel Universe, being one of the only characters worthy to wield Thor's hammer Mjolnir. And of course, we're doing this matchup now because Kilowog made like a brief, like one second cameo in the Zack Snyder Justice League movie. And also, our patrons thought it would be cool. So, As do I. Yeah, I've been really looking forward to this match. If you've never listened to one of our dual episodes before, the way we determine a winner between these two characters is by running 1,000 Monte Carlo simulations using their statistics. Now, a Monte Carlo simulation is a probabilistic model used to determine outcomes through random sampling. In our case, it randomizes statistics along a normal distribution, which is a bell curve, as a way to simulate the many variables that can occur during battle. The stat parameters we use are based on the official Marvel power grid, and we use that criteria to extrapolate the DC character stats. We've included some additional stat categories of our own, such as range, damage potential, versatility, and perception, in order to create a more complete and robust simulation. Running these 1,000 simulations gives us a percentage of wins for each character, and we declare the one with the higher percentage to be the ultimate victor given that they're more likely to win any given battle. No character has ever won 100% of the time. Comics have shown that there's always a way for Batman to defeat Superman, and we feel our method falls in line with the precedents that have been established in the comic book stories. 
And we used this method because it was the least subjective, most unbiased way to determine who would win. Of course, we are both heavily biased toward our respective allegiances, and instead of debating these matches forever, we just let the math decide for us. So there's no fan votes here, and no relying on just feats. Before we run the simulations though, we like to break down each character's histories and abilities before improvising a scenario on how we imagine one of the 1,000 simulations we run would play out beat for beat. And I think it's my turn to go over the history of the DC character first, so let me get into the backstory of Kilowog. Now the DC Comics universe is divided into 360,000 sectors, each of which is protected by at least one Green Lantern designated by the universe's first race of intelligent beings known as the Guardians of the Universe from the planet Oa. In Sector 674 exists a planet known as Bolivax Vic, which contained a densely populated society of 16 billion all of whom shared a communal mind known as the Mass. One of its inhabitants, a brilliant geneticist named Kilowog, was chosen to be his sector's Green Lantern protector when its previous protector, another Bolovaxian named Bronwilla, died. It was a great honor to be chosen, and despite the hardship of leaving the Mass communal mind for isolated and unknown space, Bolovax Vic had a long history of producing strong and brave Green Lanterns for their sector, and Kilowog proudly accepted his role. After arriving on the Green Lantern homeworld Oa, Kilowog was trained by a harsh drill sergeant Green Lantern named Erme, who often insulted Kilowog and his fellow trainees by calling them poosers. During a tough training session, Erme had to send his trainees to help save a group of Green Lanterns from a surprise attack, one of those Green Lanterns being Sinestro, who you can learn more about in our Sinestro vs. Magneto episode. Erme was killed during the rescue mission, but as he died, he commended Kilowog on his abilities and potential as a leader within the Green Lantern Corps. As time progressed, Kilowog spent more and more time on Oa and eventually assumed Erme's role as the chief instructor for new recruits, his most notable one being Hal Jordan of Earth's Sector 2814. You can learn more about Hal in our Green Lantern vs. Nova episode. Hal Jordan was the successor of Sector 2814's Green Lantern, Abin Sur, who had been killed by the interstellar villain Legion. As part of Hal's training, Kilowog helped him bring Legion to justice. During the Crisis on Infinite Earths event in which DC's multiverse was merged into a single continuity, Bolivax Vic was destroyed by an antimatter wave. Before his people were obliterated, however, Kilowog was able to store the life energy of all 16 billion Bolivaxians within his ring, thanks not only to Kilowog's sheer willpower, but also to the planet's genetic similarity and collective mind. During the course of the Crisis event, the immortal Guardians of the Universe, also known as the Owens, of which only 36 existed, were split ethically on how involved they should be in saving the multiverse. A substantial number of the Owens died during the crisis, along with hundreds of Green Lanterns. In response, the surviving Owens relinquished leadership of the Green Lantern Corps before leaving the universe, allowing the Corps to self-govern and its members to traverse freely into other sectors. Alone and depressed after the destruction of his planet, Kilowog relocated to Earth and it became the new home base of the Green Lantern Corps. While on Earth, Kilowog decided to take up residence in the USSR, since Bolovax Vic's communal mind allowed them to form a successful socialist society. Kilowog helped the Soviets develop their first superpowered force, known as the Rocket Red Brigade, a combination of forced genetic evolution and advanced technology, though he eventually became disillusioned with the flawed communist system of the Soviet nations. Kilowog left Earth and later discovered an uninhabited world in Space Sector 872 that would be suitable for the Bolivaxian lives that were still contained within his ring. His people restored, they and the planet were immediately destroyed by Sinestro. Now truly alone as the last of his kind, Kilowog was driven insane, until another Green Lantern, Arisia, whom Kilowog secretly loved, consoled him and brought him back to his senses along with the rest of the Corps. Sinestro was captured and sentenced to death by the Corps for his crimes against the universe. 
Upon his execution, however, Sinestro's life force infected the central power battery on Oa, the power source of the Green Lantern's rings, rendering Kilowog and the rest of the core powerless. Thanks to Hal Jordan, their ring's power was restored, and not long after, the Owens returned to the universe, re-establishing Oa as the homeworld base of the Green Lantern Corps, and Kilowog resided on the planet once again. Soon after, Kilowog and the rest of the Corps were killed by Hal Jordan after he was possessed and driven mad by the universal embodiment of fear known as Parallax. After Hal destroyed the planet Oa, all but one of the Owens sacrificed themselves to form a new ring, which was given to a human named Kyle Rayner. Several surviving and powerless former Green Lanterns turned to black magic to get revenge on Hal Jordan, forming a cabal known as the Brotherhood of the Cold Flame, and resurrecting the spirit of Kilowog as a Dark Lantern in order to kill Hal. Hal was defeated by Earth's superheroes, however, including Kyle Rayner, and Hal eventually sacrificed himself to reignite Earth's dormant sun. Hal's old ring was used to restore the planet Oa and the central power battery, and the Dark Lantern spirit form of Kilowog was put to rest. Eventually, Kyle Rayner resurrected the Owens, and with their help, Kilowog was restored to life, after which he helped Kyle, a resurrected Hal Jordan, and other Green Lanterns of Earth defeat Parallax and trap it in the central power battery. Returning to duty as the lead mentor and drill sergeant for the new Green Lantern Corps, Kilowog tirelessly began training thousands of new recruits, who successfully managed to defend Oa from an invasion from the Spider Guild under his direction. He also successfully led the defense of the sentient planet Green Lantern known as Mojo, as well as the defense of Earth, against a resurrected Sinestro and his forces during the Sinestro Corps War. During the Blackest Night event, Oa was swarmed with Black Lantern rings, resurrecting all of the Green Lanterns within the Owen Crypt. Kilowog's mentor, Erme, became a Black Lantern zombie and tormented Kilowog with the notion that he let Erme die in order to save Sinestro, making him responsible for the death of all the Bolivaxians. Erme then single-handedly killed all of Kilowog's new students as they attempted to defend against the destruction of the central power battery. After saving the battery, Kilowog joined the rest of the Corps on Earth for the final battle against the leader of the Black Lanterns, Necron, the universal embodiment of death, sending him back to his own realm. After the Blackest Night, Kilowog retired from his role as the Corps' drill instructor, a role he returned to after the Flashpoint event rebooted DC's continuity. And that's Kilowog's history. Powers-wise, Kilowog possesses the super strength and durability of his species. Combined with his willpower-fueled power ring, Kilowog can lift in excess of 100 tons and withstand blows of equal measure. His experience with the mental link of his people also gives him greater resistance than your average Green Lantern to mental manipulation. With his Green Lantern power ring, Kilowog can fly at high speeds and create anything he can imagine from the green energy of willpower, his only limitation being his creativity, confidence, and courage. Whether shooting laser beams or creating giant hammers or portals through space, it's been stated that Kilowog uses his ring with such force that sonic booms are generated when he uses it. As a gifted geneticist, He's also more scientifically intelligent than your average Green Lantern, and has proven himself to be a gifted tactician and leader. And that's Kilowog. There are some things that I'm going to say in my Beta Ray Bill history that you're going to be like, whoa, that's a coincidence. Really? Yeah. Are they similar? Uh, they have a few things in common, yeah. Let me tell you about it. So beyond the Milky Way galaxy, on another side of the universe called the Burning Galaxy, existed a planet called Corbin. It was inhabited by the Corbinites, a peaceful race of orange-skinned humanoids who had no means of war or defense to protect themselves from the approaching Fire Demon Surtur, who was destroying every planet in their galaxy on his way to demolish Asgard with his fiery sword. The Corbinites were forced to evacuate their entire planet in a fleet of starships and determined they would create a protector for their people to defend them on their journey to find a new home. Using their advanced technology, Corbinite scientists created a robot champion called Alpha Ray, who was a powerful yet mindless automaton. The Corbinites concluded Alpha Ray wasn't mentally suited to protect them, 
and they placed it in stasis. The Corbinites tried again to create a protector, this time choosing to cybernetically enhance one of their own people, selecting a champion through a series of physical and mental challenges. Their people's hero, the only one to survive the trials, was a Corbinite named Bill, and their scientists outfitted him with cybernetic enhancements to grant him vast strength and durability. He was dubbed Beta Ray. I didn't know Beta Ray Bill was a cyborg. Yeah, he is. Well, he just got like a notch up in the metal meter. <laughs> That's hardcore. Bill protected the Corbinites as they traveled the stars looking for a new planet to live on, accompanying his people in his sentient spaceship called Scuttlebutt. At one point in their journey, the Corbinite starships approached the Milky Way galaxy, and their presence was picked up by S.H.I.E.L.D. satellites. Director Nick Fury asked Thor to investigate, who flew out into space to confront the situation. Bill's ship perceived Thor as a threat to the Corbinites due to a similar magical energy signature to Surtur, and Bill and Thor fought. As they grappled, Thor dropped his mystic hammer Mjolnir, and at the time, it had an enchantment on it that stated that if Thor became separated from his hammer for more than 60 seconds, he would revert to his mortal form, Donald Blake. And you can learn more about him in our Wonder Woman vs. Thor duel episode. Thor transformed into his human alter ego, and Bill knocked him out, then did something no other being had ever done by this point. He lifted Thor's hammer. The enchantment on Mjolnir read, Whoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. And Bill was the only being in the whole universe at that moment who was also deemed worthy by the hammer, granting him all of Thor's powers and his armor. Odin, sensing that someone else possessed Mjolnir, magically transported Bill and Thor to Asgard in order to investigate. Bill argued he won the hammer fair and square and needed the hammer to protect the Corbinites. Yet Odin claimed the fight wasn't fair since Thor had a limitation due to the enchantment. Odin sent the two to the fiery realm of Skartheim to battle to the death for the right to wield the hammer. Bill and Thor fought to a stalemate and both collapsed from exhaustion. However, since the Corbinite race was naturally rejuvenated through heat, Bill was the first to rise back up. Instead of dealing the killing blow to Thor though, Bill saved him from slipping into some lava, believing Thor was too respectable an opponent to die. Bill's act of mercy passed Odin's test, and he had a new hammer forged by Eitri the Dwarf called Stormbreaker. The new hammer was golden, with an axe on one end. It was given to Bill, and Mjolnir was returned to Thor. Odin transferred the enchantment from Mjolnir that would transform Thor into his mortal form and placed it on Stormbreaker. This allowed Bill to revert to his original non-cybernetic Corbinite form whenever he wanted. Learning that the entity that destroyed the planet Corbin was the fire demon Surtur, the Asgardians rallied to fight their ancient enemy and his minions. Bill fought alongside them and led a team of Earth's heroes against the forces of Muspelheim, while Thor, Loki, and Odin confronted Surtur on Asgard to prevent him from causing Ragnarok, known as the Fall of Asgard. While they were successful, Odin apparently sacrificed his life to destroy the demon. Asgard was saved and Bill returned to his people, who had found a new home planet called New Corbin. Bill divided his time protecting his fellow Corbinites and fighting alongside Thor as his ally, helping him defeat the dark elf named Curse. He went on a few cosmic adventures of his own, briefly joining a cosmic hero team called the Star Masters, which also included Silver Surfer and Quasar. When Surtur revived and was set to bring about Ragnarok again, Bill joined the fight on Asgard. Thor, however, sent Bill back to New Corbin as he did not want his friend to die, and he had decided to let Ragnarok happen to end the Asgardian cycle of death and rebirth. Reluctantly, Bill said goodbye to his ally and left. While Bill was away, however, New Corbin was approached by Galactus, whom you can learn more about in our Spectre vs. Galactus episode. Fearing for their people's safety, Corbinite priests revived the android Alpha Ray out of its stasis. Bill arrived as Galactus began consuming the planet and tried to appeal to the world devourer, but he was attacked by Alpha Ray who claimed that the Corbinites did not need two protectors. New Corbin was subsequently destroyed. Bill traveled to Asgard to try and find a way to bring his people back, but the realm was desolate after Ragnarok. Bill later wandered to Earth, where he found that Asgard and its people had been resurrected and relocated there. This was during the Skrull's secret invasion. Loki convinced people Bill was a Skrull, and Thor threw Mjolnir at him, but Bill proved his identity by catching the hammer. He helped Earth's heroes repel the Skrull invasion, then returned to space seeking revenge against Galactus. However, when Bill found the World Devourer under attack, 
he had a change of heart and defended him instead. For this, Galactus created a mate for Bill named Tiasha Ray to repopulate a new Corbinite population. Ooh. Bill joined a new cosmic hero team called the Annihilators alongside the Shi'ar guard Gladiator and the Kree warrior Ronin the Accuser. Together, they operated out of the planet Nowhere to defend the universe from threats after the Guardians of the Galaxy were temporarily out of commission. Bill ended up joining the Guardians upon their return in a battle against Thanos, and later briefly journeyed back to Earth to offer Thor his own hammer Stormbreaker after he learned Thor had briefly lost the ability to wield Mjolnir due to being unworthy. Thor respectfully declined his friend Bill's offer, but later earned his worthiness again. And that's Beta Ray Bill's history. Powers-wise, Beta Ray Bill has all the powers of Thor. This includes extreme lifting strength in excess of 100 tons and durability. With his hammer Stormbreaker, he can summon all the elements of the storm, including thunder, lightning, wind, rain, hail, and snow, to their fullest potential, even tornadoes, hurricanes, and tidal waves. Beta Ray Bill can twirl his hammer to use as a shield or to open portals for teleportation. He can also summon all of his godly power into a magic blast that is strong enough to crack Galactus's armor, but will sap all of his strength in doing so. Beta Ray Bill is also a potent hand-to-hand -hand combatant, the greatest on his former planet of Corbin. And those are his abilities. So not only is this like a battle of like freaky looking aliens, it's also a battle of like the ultimate weapons in the universe. Among survivors of their dying races. So metal. <laughs> Now that we've got their histories and abilities out of the way, let's speculate on how one of the 1,000 simulated matches will go. The winner is determined by simulations, not the speculation, but it's fun to imagine how this fight could play out. We don't set any rules for this match other than the characters don't know anything about each other going in, except that the other character is a threat that needs to be put down. And we say they start off about 50 meters apart in an environment that has no bearing on the match itself, because we don't take stats for the environment. Plus, certain characters have advantages in some environments over others, and we want these characters to win on their own merit. So let's get into it. The characters meet on the battlefield. Who goes first? I'm going to say that Beta Ray Bill goes first because, like, he's no fool, like, rushing headlong into battle, but he's also a hardy warrior, you know? So mm -hmm. I think that he'd go first. So he's going to start off by spinning Stormbreaker, and he's going to launch himself straight into the air, and with, like, a fierce mighty crack of thunder he just fires down this huge ass lightning bolt right at kilowog and it's like crack a thoom crack a thoom yeah that's how it's written in the comics the okay. thunder okay well i counter your crack a thoom with a sonic boom caused by kilowog's ring when he creates a giant battery that absorbs the lightning but power batteries for green lanterns look like railroad lanterns so once this thing powers up it generates this flash of light that blinds and temporarily stuns Bill. Like a massive flashbang or flash grenade. A flash battery. Exactly. So as Bill is stunned, Kilowog just forms this ball and chain around Bill's ankle. It's so heavy, it just drops Bill like right out of the air, crashing him down into the ground and forming this massive crater. I mean, that's gotta be one damn heavy ball and chain. Oh, it was. Okay. Well, Beta Ray Bill, he gets up and he smashes this chain that's around his ankles with his hammer, just slamming it to the floor really hard with such force that it creates this shock wave that like tears up the ground and like this fissure that travels toward Kilowog and the shock wave like launches Kilowog up into the air. Okay, maybe Kilowog can fly. Doesn't matter because Bill follows up on his shock wave slam by hurling Stormbreaker right at Kilowog while he's in the air. And this hammer is like a large golden bullet that just plows right into Kilowog's gut. Okay, but before Stormbreaker could even reach Kilowog, he just generates like this giant hand in front of him that snatches the hammer out of the air. Now he has can't Stormbreaker. can't do that. Why? Why? <laughs> because this construct hand is not worthy enough, obviously, to wield Stormbreaker. Yeah, uh, Kilowog just willed it to be worthy enough. You can't fucking do that. <laughs> it, Why? Kil Kilowog's not worthy. What? And also, like, how would he know to imbue this hand with worthiness, which he can't fucking do, if he doesn't even know about the worthiness enchantment? So no, that doesn't fucking work. We're not going to get into, like, the worthiness debate like we did in our Wonder Woman Thor uh, duel. Fine, so if he can't hold Stormbreaker, then, then what happens when he snatches it with a giant green hand? Instead of the hand holding onto the hammer, the hammer pushes the hand and it slams right into Kilowog. So congratulations, Kilowog just punched himself with his own hand construct. <laughs> 
<laughs> what? Okay, uh, but Gulag's pretty durable. Okay, so he's gonna recover by the time Stormbreaker returns to Bill. And he's gonna respond by sending this massive asteroid right at Bill. How big is this asteroid? It's the size of Texas. <laughs> okay, Armageddon. Uh, well, I mean, like, Beta Ray Bill has cracked planets before, so what? this Texas-sized asteroid is just its going to be nothing. Bill winds up his hammer, and as this asteroid is about to hit him, he just smashes it into boulders. Just boulders everywhere. And then Beta Ray Bill spins his hammer to create this Texas-sized tornado what? that picks up all these boulders and is giant enough to suck Kilowog into the tornado, where he just gets pummeled by all these spinning rocks. Like, you know, these aren't real boulders, right? Like, oh, yeah. Kilowog just makes them disappear. <laughs> They're made of green energy, not rock. Uh, and since Kilowog has, like, pulled himself out of black holes, I don't think getting out of a tornado, even one the size of Texas, is going to be much of a problem for him. Okay. So to dissipate this tornado, I'm going to say Kilowog creates, like, a massive, giant alien pterodactyl creature that just flaps its giant wings and blows the tornado away. It's gotta be a big fucking pterodactyl. Oh yeah, <laughs> fucking huge. Okay, <laughs> and then the pterodactyl is just gonna swoop down, and, and and since like Kilowog can't take the hammer away from Bill, I'm just gonna say that the pterodactyl is gonna snatch Bill away from his hammer. Okay, how? He's gonna grab Bill by like both wrists with his talons and just like shake him <laughs> loose, make him drop the hammer as he carries him off into the air and eats him. Okay, so a pterodactyl made Beta Ray Bill drop Stormbreaker by shaking his arms and then ate him. Yes. Okay, so Beta Ray Bill's in this giant pterodactyl's stomach. That's right. But he can summon his hammer back to him while he's in there, and he just rips this pterodactyl a new asshole. <laughs> and then he erupts out of the creature, uh. and he calls upon this, like, intense, focused hailstorm that just freaking pelts Kilowog, and the storm is so cold that it freezes Kilowog solid and ice. I totally forgot that Bill could summon his hammer back to him. Like, yeah. I thought he was going to have, like, 60 seconds before he was just normal pterodactyl food. <laughs> okay, so Kilowog is frozen. Not for long, though, because he's just going to set himself on fire with, like, a green flame. It's just going to melt the ice. And then he's going to take that massive fiery plasma and just blast it right at Bill like a, like a flamethrower. That won't do anything because Corbinites are like naturally resistant to extreme temperatures. Ugh. So Beta Ray Bill is just going to fly straight into this plasma blast, hammer first, flying straight toward Kilowog, and then he's just going to smash Kilowog's ring with Stormbreaker. What? Just crack that thing right in half. Okay, so Kilowog is probably pretty shocked by this, so he's going to react just by like using his own natural strength to punch Bill like right in his horse face, sending him flying backwards and shattering all of his horse teeth. And while he has a little bit of time, he's gonna summon his power battery, the, the lantern, and recite the Green Lantern Oath, focusing his willpower on restoring his ring what? as it recharges. Okay, all right, so while Kilowog's like fucking reciting poetry and taking all this time to do that, Beta Ray Bill is powering up his God Blast. And then by the time Kilowog is done reciting the oath, he's just vaporized. I mean, Kilowog says it like really fast. He just speed wraps the oath, okay? Like Busta Rhyme style. Okay. <laughs> and then before Bill could power up his God Blast, Kilowog just generates from his fully powered ring duplicates of the entire Green Lantern Corps, who just fill the skies around what? Bill and blast him simultaneously with their rings. The entire core? Yes. How many people are in the core? About 720,000. And Kilowog can create all of this? I mean, he's one of the premier members of the core. The, the guy has a lot of willpower. I don't know, this seems like overkill and a great way to drain his ring, especially since Beta Ray Bill's probably gonna be able to block all these shots. What are these, laser blasts? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's just gonna spin his hammer around blocking all these blasts. Mm -hmm. And when he spins it around, he creates this portal that he just flies into, coming out at another end of the battle, you know, getting himself out of this situation. Then he unleashes his God Blast, which decimates the entire Construct Green Lantern Corps, including Kilowog, ending this match. Except that the core creates, like, this massive shield blocking the God Blast. Okay. Now that, and now that Bill has drained of his godly power, the entire core together is just going to create this massive hammer of their own and just slam it down on Bill. 
No, the God Blast went right through that shield because it wasn't actually an entire core of Green Lantern each making this shield. It was just one ring doing this. It was just Kilowog's ring. And if Beta Ray Bill's God Blast can crack Galactus's armor, you can bet your ass it'll crack that shield. I'm going to say that Kilowog's willpower was strong enough to block that blast. You're out of your mind. <laughs> willpower is like so stupid. It's like so subjective. Like, how do you gauge willpower? It's so dumb. Well, I don't know what to tell you. It happened. <laughs> no, it didn't. Uh, let's go ahead and leave the match there. Either Kilowog's willpower was somehow strong enough to block the God Blast, right. or the God Blast eradicated him. Let's go ahead and run these character stats in our simulation runner and find out who came out on top. We'll be right back. All right, so we put all their stats in, including the beauty stat, which Beta Ray <laughs> Bill totally excelled in over oh. Kilowog. Uh. We ran speed, evasiveness, durability, strength, damage level, fighting skill, range, intelligence, perception, and versatility. These guys were pretty comparable in most of those categories. Comparable and extremely powerful. These guys have high stat values. Yeah, for like durability, strength, damage level, range. Even speed. Yeah, they're all topping the charts in those categories. Where they mainly deferred was in intelligence and fighting, where we said that Beta Ray Bill was more of a warrior, whereas Kilowog was more of a scientist. Right, exactly. But that kind of balanced out. Yeah, yeah. We also said they differed in terms of versatility. Both of their weapons are incredibly powerful and versatile. Meaning that they each can adapt to any number of situations that are thrown their way. But Green Lanterns are adaptable unlike most other heroes can be. Yeah, they have a ring that can almost literally do anything. So it's really hard to beat them when it comes to versatility. So taking all of that into account, who do you think came out on top? Beta Ray Bill, because lightning is yellow. Isn't it blue? No, nah, but it's yellow. Even if it was. <laughs> Kilowog, he's gone over that whole weak to yellow thing that the Green Lanterns used to have. He's a veteran Green Lantern that, that doesn't have to deal with that problem. Well, our Instagram followers think that Beta Ray Bill will win, and they voted by 22 votes to 11 votes. So 67% of the people think Beta Ray Bill will win this one. I'm just going to chalk that up to a popularity contest once again. You think Beta Ray Bill is more popular than Kilowog? It's either popularity or they're rooting for the underdog. I don't know how else to explain <laughs> it. But I have the official results right here. The winner of the matchup between the Green Lantern Kilowog and Beta Ray Bill is... Kilowog. I don't believe you. Are you by, joking? No. By 54.4%, Beta Ray Bill lost by only winning 45.6% of his matches, or 456 you fuck with stats? out of 1,000 matches. Did you fuck with the stats? No. Sorry, dude. Green Lantern would beat Thor. Did you remove the beauty stat that we put in? I left it, but sorry to say Kilowog won in that category too. No, he didn't. <laughs> I'd rather have a lovable pig dog face than a scary horse skeleton face. No, you got that all wrong. I'd much rather have a cool horse face. Honestly, I'd rather have neither. That's true. <laughs> I'm just going to say what I always say after every match with Green Lantern. Those characters are just overpowered. They can do too many things. Whatever, dude. Green Lantern has lost one of our dual matches before. Don't try to negate my anger with your facts. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> That does it for this duel. Let us know what you thought about the results by writing to us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com or by visiting us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can find links to all of our accounts by visiting our website, dynamicduel.com. And on our site, you can also find a link to our Patreon page where we offer bonus content in our very own Marvel vs. DC card game called Dynamic Duel War. Check it out right after this episode. Our lowest Patreon tier is only $2 a month. As a tie-in to this episode, next week we will be reviewing the animated film Green Lantern Emerald Knights, which I haven't actually seen before, but I hear a lot of good things about. The movie does feature a whole story about Kilowog. Oh, perfect. Look forward to that review next week. In the meantime, we want to remind everyone to, again, please subscribe to our show if you haven't, or please leave a rating or review on your platform of choice. Sharing this show on social media or in person is also a big help for us. But that does it for this episode. We want to give a big thanks to our executive producers, Ken Johnson, Jace Crump, John Starosky, John Spees, Zachary Hepburn, and John Beccianina for helping make this podcast possible. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Up, up, and away. True believers. <laughs>